We're working on problem 4.6 of the Computer Science 320 2014 Winter 2 final exam practice problems, and this problem asks us to write pseudocode for a dynamic programming version of the algorithm. Be sure to clearly indicate the size of the table we'll need and the order in which we'll solve subproblems. So, dynamic programming is just a way to rearrange the problems, basically so that we never have to ask whether we've already solved a subproblem. Every problem that we solve, we will already have solved all of its subproblems. That can be really useful sometimes, particularly where it means we can throw away some old answers. Like, for example, if, if you've solved Fibonacci uh, with dynamic programming, then you know that uh, to get the Fibonacci number of n, you first calculate the entries less than n. But you don't really need all those entries to compute the value for n, you just need the previous two. That's a constant number of entries, and so you can actually throw away the rest of the table. And conceptually, you can have this, this window that is too long looking onto the table and just slide that window across the table. And generally speaking, the advantage you get from dynamic programming in memory when you can do it is that you get one of these constant width windows and you're able to slide it along one of the dimensions in your table, and so you get a reduction by a factor of n in memory usage, which can be a big, big deal. Okay, so those are the things we should be looking out for. How do we reorder the problems so that we know each time we try to solve a new problem that we've already solved all the subproblems it depends on? And are we going to be able to do one of these clever sliding window things? So let's take a look back up again. Um, it might be really useful to look at this table that we drew right at the end of working on the previous problem. And that was the one where we said, oh, the entries in the table that we actually use look kind of like this. So what I'm going to do is draw a new table like that. And let me make it really specific. So I'm going to have i across the top here. I'm going to have j down here. And I'm going to say we're working on that very first initial problem that we dealt with way, way back at the start of this problem. Let me scroll up and show you it so you remember it. Here it is, way up here. There are seven entries in the table. And we've got values and we've got costs for them. We should be able to fill up one of these tables and we should be able to figure out what the optimal solution for, for this actually is. Of course, we know the optimal solution is just binary search for this table, but we also know that that's something of a coincidence. With different values of costs, binary search might not have been the optimal approach. So let's just go back down. So what we're saying is that i and j can range from 0 up to 6, or if you want to think of it this way, i can range from 0 up to 7, and j can range from negative 1 up to 6. It's a bit of an awkward way to think about it, so let's see if I can do the 0 through 6 thing instead. Uh, so if i ranges from 0 to 6, I'm just going to say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, oops, I need more space. Let's figure I'm going to need more space for j, too. And these are the values for j. And now let's just fill in this table. We're only going to have an entry for the table when i is less than or equal to j, so we're going to have an entry here, and an entry here, and an entry here. So the table's going to look something like this. Okay, so for example, uh, this entry in the table right here represents the case where we're looking at the subarray ranging from point 1 through point 4, including both sides, so the points 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right, now we've got all the entries we need. Anything we try to access that's outside of this table, we know its value is just 0. Now, let's look back at that same entry again, the entry where i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 4. And the question is, which subproblems does this depend on? If you look at our code, what we do is we take the minimum over this new variable k, ranging from 1 to 4, and we rely on subproblems. Let's, let's just write them out. So when i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 4, k will be equal to 1, 2, 3, or 4. The new values of i and j that we're going to be interested in, there there will be two pairs. So let's say there's i left and j left. Let's say there's i right, and there's j right. Okay. When k is equal to 1, uh, i left, well, i left is always going to be 1. Okay. Uh, speaking of which, j right is always going to be 4. Those are the easy cases. Um, j left will be k minus 1, so this will be 0, and then 1, 2, 3. 
and I right is going to be 2, 3, 4, 5. And of course, this is a trivial case, and this is a trivial case over here. Those are the cases where the, the subarray is empty, but we would still put those down. And let's see where those correspond to in the table. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna highlight all of them. I'll highlight the left ones in blue. I'll highlight the right ones in say green. Okay. So the left ones, that's the one zero case. I'm not gonna highlight that, but I'll point out where it is. Uh, when i is equal to this is this is i over here. When i is equal to one, and uh, j is equal to zero. Oh, uh, that actually, well, that is outside the table. That That's outside the table right here. Okay. Um, then i is equal to one and j is equal to one. Well, that's in the table. And then i is equal to one and j is equal to two. And actually, we're going to be going along this column, right? But we're only going to go that far. We're not all going to go all the way back to the original problem. That's a good thing. If the original problem depended recursively on itself, this wouldn't be a very good recursive solution. It would be an infinite loop. Uh, so that was the left ones. Let's just highlight those in blue so we know that correspondence. The right ones are these. And those are uh, when i is equal to 2 and j is equal to 4. So here's 2 and here's 4. So it's this entry. When i is equal to 3 and j is still equal to 4. So we're going to be running along this row. And that last one, the trivial case, that's when i is equal to 5 and j is equal to 4 right here. And by the way, notice something that happened here. We went in this direction for the blue ones, for the left ones, and we went in this direction for the green ones. So corresponding pairs are like this blue one corresponds to this green one, and so on down the line. The middle ones correspond, and then the bottom one in the blue corresponds to the rightmost one in the green. And those are the subproblems that we look at. So we kind of look at this... this um, pair of lines extending out from a given point. Okay, and that's going to be true for any entry that we look at. We'll look at a pair of lines extending out to the frontier of the table. Uh, so what order should we compute things in the table? All we need to do is pick an ordering that will ensure that we only compute a new value after we've already computed all the values it would depend on. So we have to go in the opposite direction of, of the, the highlighting here, basically. We can't compute the yellow cell until we've computed all of the green cells and all of the blue cells. Um, there are ways that you could do this without going diagonally in the table. But when I see something like this, what, what I think of is, hey, take a look at this diagonal frontier along here. Everything along this diagonal, you're allowed to compute right away. It doesn't depend on anything. And once you've computed that diagonal, well, then you're allowed to compute everything along the next diagonal. And once you've computed the next diagonal, well, you're allowed to compute everything along the next diagonal, and so on and so forth. So to me, the natural way to solve this is to solve the diagonals moving towards the sort of peak of our triangle here. And along a diagonal, none of the problems relate to each other directly, so it doesn't matter which direction you move on the diagonal. You might have come up with a different ordering for this, and that's totally okay. Uh, it turns out, for example, that you could instead work your way down the uh, j values and start at j equals 0 and i equals 0. And then as long as on the i values you work from right to left, you'll be fine. You will only visit a cell after you've solved all the subproblems that it depends on. But for me, the diagonal thing is natural. So I just need to write a piece of code that's going to loop along the diagonals. And what I notice uh, along the diagonal is i is always less than or equal to j. It's just a question of how much less i is than j. If i is 0 less than j, then we're on the very first diagonal. This is the 0 distance diagonal. If i is 1 less than j, then we're along this diagonal. If i is 2 less than j, we're along this diagonal, and so on and so forth, until we get to the, the peak entry here, the peak of the triangle as I described it earlier. j is 6, i is 0. j is 6, i is 0. And so they are 6 apart. So we're going to let the delta between them go from 0 up to 6. OK, now I need room for my code. I've taken up all this space with my table. Okay. 
I'm going to grab all my table and sketch here, and I'm just going to move them all off to the side. So in case we need to refer to them, we'll have them there. Okay, so now I need to write some pseudocode. It's going to be worthwhile for me to remember what my memoize code looks like, so please go and look at my memoize code so you remember. I'm just going to dive in here. So I want min cost. And I'm going to be given an array of costs, just like last time. And I'm going to be given its length. Unlike last time, however, um, well, I am going to need a table. I'm not going to need recursive calls. I'm not going to need a recursive function because I know when it's time to look up the solution to a subproblem, it doesn't require a recursive call to get that solution. It just requires a table lookup. Just like last time, I'm going to use an n by n table. Unlike last time, it really doesn't matter whether I initialize my table because I know when I want a table entry, I've already got it. And then I just need my loop to set up the problems. So I need values of i and j, but what I said is I'm actually going to start with this delta thing, right? So I'm going to say for delta is 0 to, well, where did that 6 come from? It was actually n minus 1. i and j can be n minus 1 apart. So for delta equals 0 to n minus 1, um, I'm going to say for i, i starts at 0. Uh, how high up can i go? Um, this is a point where it's going to be useful to look at our table. So I'm just going to scroll across to the table. Here's the table. Uh, let's take a particular example of delta, like, like the 2 entry here. Uh, i starts at 0. And if we follow that two line all the way down to this entry down here, we see that i goes as high as 4. Why doesn't it go any higher than that? Well, when i is equal to 4, j is equal to 4 plus 2, which is 6. That's as high as we go because j is n minus 1. So I only want i to go up as high as n minus 1 minus delta. So for i equals 0 to n minus 1 minus delta. And let's just double check that one more time. When delta is 0, i is going to go all the way up to 6, and that corresponds to my diagram. Uh, when delta is 6, so I should only be looking at one entry, i is going to go from 0 up to n minus 1 minus n minus 1, which is the largest value you can be, n minus 1 minus n minus 1 is just 0. So i will go from 0 to 0, and that sounds just right. So that gives me the right values of i. I'm going to scroll back across again to my code. You might be tempted at this point to put in another loop for j. Don't. This is only a doubly nested loop, right? We've got a two-dimensional array. We should need a doubly nested loop, and that's all. Um, there's no need for another loop here. The value of j is defined by i and delta. So just j is equal to i plus delta. It is exactly i plus delta. OK. So I've got i and j. Uh, now I just need the value for that i and j. Is i less than or equal to j? Yes, i is less than or equal to j. So this is just going to be exactly the recursive case of our recurrence, except we know we can just look up the table entry at this point instead of actually making a recursive call. So I'm going to jump back up to my memoized code and remind myself what that recursive case looked like. It's this whole case right here. So I'm going to jump back down and copy that case over through the magic of editing. Okay, now I'm done, except I haven't filled in these yellow and blue highlighted areas. What I did was just to copy down what was above. Uh, the thing that I left out was the calls to the helper function. So if we look up above, what you can see is that I call helper to recursively compute values on the left and on the right of the various routes that I try. Now I don't want to call helper anymore uh, because there's no need for a recursive call. I already know I have these solutions in the table, but I do still want to use this lookup function that I had up above right here. I'm just going to highlight all of this. Okay, I still want to use lookup um, because I'm still being lazy and not making sure that I have everything in my table that I need, so this helps me initialize my table entries properly. 
Okay, so effectively I get initialization for free. The only things I have to initialize are my base case entries. I don't even store my base cases in the table. I just store them by having the lookup function handle them. So I don't want to call helper. I don't want to access the table directly because I'm being a little bit lazy and not setting up my table so it actually has the base cases in it. Instead, I want to call this helper function lookup. So let's jump back down and do that. Here we'll call lookup. And we're going to call it with the table. And i and just as above, k minus 1. So if we look at the code up above, it uses i and k minus 1 in the yellow case. And in the blue case, it uses k plus 1 and j. There we go. That's the core of my code. I'm not going to bother rewriting the lookup function. It's the same as it was before. I just need to return the eventual answer. Uh, with my recursive version, the eventual answer is the, the answer when I make the recursive call to helper initially. Um, so if we look back up at the recursive version, I actually know which table entry I want to look at. The recursive version tells me. I just need to look at the first parameters I pass to recursive call, those are 0 and n minus 1, so those must be the values for the table entry I want. That must be this table entry here. And let's just double check, is it 0 and n minus 1? Yeah, i is 0 and j is n minus 1. So in the end, I want to return I'm going to be extra careful here. I'm going to look, use lookup again just in case we were given a trivial example, but just t brackets. Um, 0 and n minus 1 would probably be fine here. There we go.